All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to lab number, uh, class number nine. This is the lecture portion of it. And we will be talking today about a new topic, which is essentially a very important topic. We will be talking about interaction and regression models. So firstly, about the concept of interaction, then the incorporation, uh, incorporation of interaction into regression models, then the testing and the general handling of significant interactions in the context of uh, likelihood ratio testing, the test for the significance of an interaction. We'll be talking about stratified analysis as a way to uh, quantify treatment effect on various uh, subgroups that are determined by the interaction. Then talk about some specific parts of interaction. So that is a three ways interaction the relationship to predictions, uh, subgroup, uh, subgroup analysis on the RCTs, which is a topic actually close to my heart because I just recently did a paper accepted where we exactly did that. Um, and so this is this is very powerful kind of subgroup uh, analysis and, and um, subset analysis in RCTs when you have an underlying hypothesis but common in our cities, but we'll talk about this a little more um, in a little bit. Then we will be talking about Simpson's paradox, which is which is quite fascinating when it comes to interactions. And uh, it's a fascinating dynamic, particularly in population studies and observational data. Then we will briefly be talking about lab nine and lab nine is gonna be a separate uh, video as usual. Good, uh, so we have the RMD file, uh, just like uh, in the usual setting, we are essentially uh, looking at um, a folder that we've created in our in-class folder on the desktop. So this is class nine, we have lab and lecture folders. In the lecture folders, you are meant to have uh, the RMD file. The Bickley and Berkeley paper is actually uh, a paper that shows uh, interactions in a uh, real life setting. Um, I will, in addition to that, also include that paper that I have in, uh, accepted uh, from a study in, in the dialysis population, which is quite fascinating. You also need to have the enhance RN1 file. So you know this file already. Uh, it is part uh, of the content folder on the blackboard. And we further have two PNG files, which are gonna be part of the knitted RMD file. So essentially you are being asked to knit this file that should be without a problem. And here we go. So we are basically at class nine. I'm going to go in view mode. As soon as I find one way to do that, um, I get the little bit of a person. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Class nine today is 1031, uh, so that it is online by midnight. Um, so as said, we're gonna be talking about the concept of interaction, the incorporation and regression models, the testing, some additional remarks, and then lab nine, which is will really include again, they have RACT data. This is the outline that Professor Seng has created, and uh, it will essentially be quite insightful on the topic of um, interactions. So essentially we have a linear regression model and we know already the linear regression model. We have on the left-hand side, we have our Y. We have on the right-hand side, we have our covariate and uh, essentially coefficients including the so-called slopes, and we also have the intercept here. For the case of a linear regression model, we also have that error term that is basically determined by the variability in Y. So that was actually an interesting question of the exam, and we have briefly talked about this, so I hope you all have seen the exam review. Um, 
So there's a difference between a, an, an, a residual error term and the residual error term for uh, the predicted outcome. So this essentially is not necessarily normally distributed or unimodal. It is normally distributed, but it's not necessarily unimodal. Uh, in, in, in. Well, it is not normally distributed and not necessarily unimodal. This is dependent on the coefficients and on the nature of the coefficients. <laughs> as you know from the diagnostics plot that we have uh, looked at. Then we have the logistic regression. Uh, logistic regression, we know that we essentially have here instead uh, of uh, a Y on the left-hand side, which is a continuous variable, we have uh, now essentially a binary outcome. This binary outcome will essentially be uh, quantified as the log of the odds. So we basically, we have a log it function that characterizes the probability of an outcome that equals one versus the outcome of equals zero. So essentially we are with this log it function, we aim to uh, transform our outcome and our prediction of the outcome into a linear fashion. Uh, what is again important to note is that on the right hand side here, we again have the intercept, we again have the slopes and coefficients uh, and, and the covariates uh, up to beta p uh, and xp. We do not have an error term because on the left hand side, this is basically it's uh, the occurrence, it's a discrete binary variable that basically characterizes the occurrence of a certain condition. So the interpretation of our beta is here that it's a change in an expected y or the log it function of our probability of y equals one that is associated with one unit change in the covariate constant of the other covariate. This is also important to keep in mind that that odds ratio and this uh, log odds essentially characterize the increase with one unit change and the other variables the other covariates do not affect these so each of these is essentially characterizing this change irrespective of the other covariates and can be interpreted as such under the assumption that all else being equal is being equal um, it is also considered in um, that this one unit change is constant and regardless of the other covariates and this constant relationship assumption might not necessarily be true. So that's also to be kept in mind that this uh, for linear regression is supposed to be true. It may not be true. One example may for example be that um, we have uh, changes in blood pressure as a function of age. So these changes in blood pressure may not be linearly uh, associated with um, age. So that means uh, you will basically be looking at a case of non-linearity meaning that we have this non-linearity and that was part of the last uh, lab where we essentially uh, plotting SPP as the outcome on the y-axis versus age on the x-axis. If this change is somewhat linear, you essentially can assume linearity. If it's not linear and it basically gets accelerated or decelerated with different age categories, we're looking at the case of non-linearity. And um, if we have such a, uh, if we have now uh, changes with uh, SPP as a function of age, and this differs between females and males, this would be a case for interaction. This means that there's an interaction between females and males as a binary covariate and age in the prediction of blood pressure. So this interaction essentially is called a so-called synergistic effect. So we have XJ and XK to in, uh, interact with each other. 
The expected amount of change in Y is associated with a unit of change in XJ, but this is not independent of XK. It varies with the value of XK. That means the magnitude of one affects the, uh, the outcome in relationship to the change of the other. So this uh, XJ and XK are in sum not additive in the relationship to Y. It happens if both XJ and XK are considered to causally affect the Y, but XJ essentially is then considered an effect modifier of XK in their prediction of the Y. XK as such may be considered an effect modifier of XJ. So this essentially is uh, depending on uh, the pathophysiological or physiological relationship between both, which one you would consider to be the effect modifier. Arithmetically, it may be hard to distinguish at times. So which one is now the study variable? This depends on the research question and the um, pathophysiological and physiological relationships. Um, what is important to keep in mind, effect modifiers are not necessarily confounders. They're just effect modifiers of that covariate in the prediction to the outcome. So the way you would express this uh, is essentially in the notation is xj multiplied by xk. This is also how you will include it in, and you will see this later on, this is also how you will include it in your R code. So it can be xj multiplied by xk or simplified also as xj xk. With the type of variable, can be either the type of variables, it's basically both, can be either a continuous and discrete relationship or interaction, a discrete discrete relationship or interaction, and a continuous continuous interaction. All three of these are essentially kind of difficult uh, to interpret. They're not as straightforward as you would usually see them in uh, regression models, and they need to be interpreted in their uh, conjoint kind of association. So the way you would, uh, show this, you basically you have with better one x1 and better two main x2, you have your mean terms, uh, your, 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 uh, your general main terms or main effects, whereas um, the interaction essentially is interpreted here with a third coefficient and your conjoint x1, x2. Alternatively, you could express it also here in this format. Uh, you basically would have here the intercept, your main effect, and here uh, your beta two, which is the coefficient of x2, beta three x1. So that's essentially um, part, a part of this interaction and an x2 uh, multiplying each of these terms was in the parentheses. So the relation between x2 to y depends now clearly on the x1, meaning that you will now have a, a better one and you will need uh, in this better one also incorporate your better three X two. So essentially you are getting uh, a situation where you have a better two X two, which is your main effect of uh, X two. And you also get the simplified version of better one plus better three x2 multiplied by x1. So you're basically you're subsetting and, and, and you're replacing and substituting to basically get to this uh, equation that is essentially uh, rearranging this equation. So the relationship of x1 to y depends on x2. And it is important to clarify based on your research question, based on uh, physiological and pathophysiological concepts, which one is your study variable. So we will be talking about this in the context of that uh, example that we have started on before. 
So this is essentially, uh, again, using the enhanced data set from the research notes. So this is enhanced 2005 to 2006. This is uh, dealing with uh, participants in the age of 20 to 84. For Y, we essentially we have systolic blood pressure. X1 is age, X2 is gender in a binary format, either one or zero. Without the interaction, we're essentially looking at uh, the format that we're seeing here. So then the outcome variable systolic blood pressure is here the intercept plus the better one X1, the better two X2, plus the error term. With the interaction, we're looking at better zero plus better one X1 plus better two X2. And here our interaction coefficient X1, X2 plus the error term. So this is how you rearrange uh, X1, X2 with uh, the interaction term included. The way you would include this in uh, an R code, essentially just mentioned before, either you use an asterisk or you use it as a column. So you essentially, you again start the library's haven and the library uh, stargazer. You open your, oops, how did I manage this? You open uh, the RN1 uh, SPSS file. You fit again the linear model, blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, as a function of exact age and male. You fit again uh, your blood pressure then uh, with the interaction term as exact age and male, which are our main effects now at this point, and here with the interaction term. As the output, you essentially will get this model. So you have here, as the intercept, you have a 96, you have exact age 0.5, you have male, you have 2.687. What's different now with the interaction terms, the main effect do, so the age uh, main effect changes to a smaller degree, which is not actually that small when you take into account as age will essentially be quite of magnitude uh, in more advanced ages and uh, you get a substantially larger effect in males, which is here determined. So quantitative, it's not an additive kind of situation anymore where you can just add this um, in the same fashion as you can do for linear regression, where you basically you use this as the group difference. This is now not possible anymore. So essentially you need now uh, see this main effect in conjunction with uh, that interaction term. So you essentially you get now a better zero plus better one X1, better two X2 and a better three X1, X2 and this error term. Uh, your Y hat essentially looks now as uh, 87.292 plus the 0 0.7731 plus uh, 22809 x2 minus the interaction term multiplied with x1 x2. So for females, this essentially uh, means now that you essentially will multiply this term with zero because you have male equals one, uh, multiplying this with zero and multiplying the interaction term with zero, this essentially drops out. So you essentially you have the y hat without each of these two terms. For males, essentially you stay with uh, 87. You have 87 plus 22.809 multiplied by one for male, plus the 0 0.7731 exact age, minus the 3.981 multiplied by X1, which is our age, right? So essentially these terms were multiplied by, um, so this term was multiplied by one. This uh, interaction is now also active because it was also multiplied by one. And so the X1 essentially uh, determines then the age. So in the light of this calculation, you essentially get 110.001 plus 0 0.33 
x1, which is essentially the difference between these two. Right? So this is a simple example, essentially, how to deal with interaction terms. And what you see is that there is indeed uh, a gender-specific change in the prediction of uh, systolic blood pressure with age. So you essentially see that females increase uh, substantially more, particularly than in a later age, whereas males do start off substantially higher, which is well known, but the increase is also less steep, which I'm not sure this classically would be seen as a linear relationship, but that's uh, because you're essentially looking at a stronger increase uh, of the menopause in, in, in women. Um, and I think this is to some extent to be factored in here. But in terms of the interaction, essentially, this is a very good example how to detect this. So if we have now a second example, so we have now two, uh, well, we have two covariates and we have one outcome. The outcome here essentially is not um, a continuous variable anymore. It's a categorical variable that is essentially um, here a categorized uh, hypertension variable that basically uses historic blood pressure greater than 140. So again, as per the GNC and new criteria, I don't think this is strictly the, uh, classified as hypertension anymore, but for the sake of this example here, okay, we, can, we can take the 140 and, and uh, accept these. So we want to quantify our variable hypertension as, as historic blood pressure greater than 140. Gender is one for males, zero for females, makes it arithmetically easier. That's what was recoded. Then we have education, where we have either not graduated from high school, which is considered our, our reference level. And then we have, uh, secondly, we've graduated from high school, but not from college. And then we've certainly have those with a college degree. So the way you're dealing with this is, uh, essentially we have here NHANES hypertension. And this is the same kind of recording uh, approach that we have used already in the past. We're using the if else function to essentially characterize all systolic blood pressures greater than 140 as a one. 140 and less as zero. And now here, uh, quite an effective way of excluding uh, all NAs. So those of you that have watched the exam review and that have yesterday been on of the uh, exam review, we have looked at this, and I think we also did it in the past. So we have a subset. A uh, subset is we're taking the entire enhanced data set. Uh, we're taking only, and here we're defining essentially, so subset, the subset function essentially takes a subset and has here after the comma, the criterion according to which you're subsetting. So essentially when the exclamation mark always indicates that we're taking everything but what follows after that exclamation mark. So essentially excluding everything that is NA, which is a missing value for hypertension. We're excluding everything that is NA for education and we're excluding everything that is NA for male gender which I don't think this is gonna occur, but uh, I think education and hypertension has missing values. So what we have here is a, a logical or, uh, this essentially means that it is, we're excluding, and this now look at the, uh, uh, and, uh, the brackets. So the bracket actually opens here and closes only here. So all of these are independent terms. So everything, every hypertension that is an A or every education that is an A or every gender entry that is an A will be excluded in this subset of the enhanced overall data frame. And this will be, and this is, this um, essentially is the equal sign that is being used in R, this will be assigned to enhanced three. Then in the third step, we're taking enhanced three uh, dollar EDU 
and recoding this into a factor. This essentially now uh, implies that we have a discrete outcome variable and we have uh, categorically a discrete covariate, which essentially now prompts us to uh, use uh, a logistic regression. So we're building FIT3 and FIT4, whereas FIT3 is uh, just like we coded for logistic regression, it's up tension as the outcome, as the discrete outcome, as a function of mail and EDU. The family is binomial, we know that because it's a binomial distribution that will be investigated and we're using data in Haynes 3. For FIT4, we're basically reusing the same outline. We're having uh, hypertension, male, male, and EDU as the main effects, and we have the interaction term included. The family is binomial, and the data is n Haynes. The outcome of this is now as seen here. So we have for the regular model, we have uh, here the constant, we have the male main effect, we have EDU2, where EDU2 was uh, high school, but not college. And here, I don't know if this, okay. And here we have uh, college, uh, college graduate. And we have basically uh, not graduated from high school or college uh, as the reference group and female as the reference group. So essentially, uh, including now the error term, uh, no, not the error term, sorry, there's no error term in logistic regression, including now the interaction and the main effect will basically give us substantially different uh, coefficient for the main effects and uh, two additional interaction terms we, which need to be seen in, in the context of um, the model for this um, prediction. So if you want to test now uh, for um, the significance of your interaction and uh, the actual need of including this uh, interaction, you will essentially uh, build an ANOVA uh, testing this in a chi-squared distribution. So you essentially you compare FIT3 versus FIT4 you get here the deviance residuals and you essentially, you are testing whether there's a significant, uh, a significant effect of your, in okay, I'm, this is, I don't understand this, but there are only so many here. Okay, so we can run. Okay. stop pressing the mouse button now. Okay, so essentially we are seeing here uh, residuals, degrees of freedom. They are changing with the number of additional covariates. As we know, we have the residual deviance. They are getting smaller. So the deviations are getting smaller, degrees of freedom to additional degrees of freedom from the uh, three terms. We have, um, so it's a two degrees of freedom because with three terms, three minus one is two. Then we have a deviance and we get our significance, our estimates of the probability of this being significantly different following a chi-square distribution. And this interaction is significant. As we see here, because it's at a p-value smaller than 5%, right? So, so now if we have, um, If we have now a significant interaction, um, you want to know to what extent this interaction does essentially if, take effect on your outcome. For this reason, you essentially you conduct what is called here a post stratification analysis. That means that the analysis is now conducted within each stratum of interest. And you're basically you're taking a step back then and you're interpreting your results in the scope of the research question within those two strata. 
So for example, two, uh, Professor Sang has included the assessment of the odds ratio between males and females, uh, only predicting the outcome only uh, as per the level of education, which essentially we know modifies the association between gender and hypertension. So the way this would be done, and this is also then what we will be discussing in the lab, we basically we're building now uh, FIT 5A, B and C. So we essentially we're doing now, um, okay, uh, I misspoke and uh, I didn't misspeak, uh, I had it wrong in my memory. So we essentially we are now uh, looking um, at the odds ratio between males and females, and I hope it was understandable like this, at within each level of education. So that means we need to build three models for each level of uh, education. So no high school, high school, and college. So essentially, we're building three model. Education is one, two, or three. So this gives us those uh, subsets. So we're building the three subsets. And again, just like with the subset function before, uh, we're building a subset where education equals one, which is our no high school education two, which is our high school data, and education three is our college graduates. We're getting now within these three strata, we're getting uh, three different models. Uh, we're getting model number one, and we see that in college graduates, this association or this odds ratio is actually. Uh, pointing in a different direction. That basically means that in uh, males with college degree, they have a higher risk with an odds ratio of 1.64, um, which was not significant and not present in those uh, with a lower degree of education. So that means there's a significant impact between gender and education for hypertension. Education modified the relationship between gender and hypertension. So male tends to have lower risk without college degree, but these associations are not significant. So that's uh, also kind of interesting, but essentially um, what's really the variable the covariate of interest here is only uh, gender in the context of and those was a college degree. So why are we doing this post stratification analysis? Um, so when you have a significant interaction and you have those main effects, it's just you you allowing to get quantifiable values, you get quantifiable kind of associations. And you suddenly you can basically uh, communicate this to non-statisticians, so back to the, um, so for hypertension, obviously there's a probability, that's, uh, it's the odds, which, which kind of makes it easier to understand. Uh, if you would, for example, have a continuous arrival, you can uh, look into these strata um, to what extent quantitatively that effect actually will modify the outcome. So it's just, it's, it's, easier to report in journals, articles, as well as uh, reporting it to non-statisticians or non-epidemiologists. Um, problem with that is that this research is then not generalizable to the whole population. So you always, you have to see it constrained on the population you have looked at. Next problem with that is that this is substantially smaller sample size because the subset of the greater sample size that is particularly important to keep in mind when you do that uh, for randomized controlled trials, which you will see in a, little, in, in a little bit. And as a consequence of the smaller sample size, obviously the power is reduced. Right? Conceptually, it's different from a, a stratification design samples, um, which we have discussed uh, with the block randomization, which is uh, a different kind of approach where you do a stratified analysis irrespective of uh, significances of interactions. So where you're not empirically te test for these uh, interactions and only uh, include them when they're actually significant. Um, when you stratify by design, you essentially need to always uh, treat them as stratified analysis 
or include a term that essentially accounts for these uh, blocked entities within the sample. Um, yeah, so three factor uh, interaction terms. So this is this is very very advanced and essentially not only advanced but also very complicated to interpret. So I personally have never once seen Professor Sengs as they're rarely used. I have never seen one, but maybe he has uh, examples. I am not aware of one that, that I have seen at least in my uh, literature. Um, it's, it's also in terms of interpretation, it's, it's getting very, very complicated. You would need to account for really large samples to essentially um, be able to subset the data then. Um, but again, it's like if you look at gender, race, education, educations, hypothetically, it could make sense because you know that there's an effect of gender that we know now. We know there's an effect of uh, education and we know there's a, uh, also an association between race and blood pressure. So hypothetically, it could be insightful, but it's, 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 it's quite high, hard to essentially not only not only interpret it, but also that you actually get a significant attraction term for various reasons, right? Um, with a very large sample size, you essentially may, but uh, then on the other hand, it's, um, the interpretation is still a problem there. Okay, what's important to keep in mind is that interaction does not necessarily imply an association or correlation. Um, however, what you have associations is uh, that the variations in X1 and X2 are not independent, so they are related to each other, but they are not quantitatively uh, related in the way uh, the interaction implies, so it's really the, the, the prediction of the outcome that essentially uh, includes a conjoint kind of dynamic. Well, basically one affects the other and one correlates with the other and affects the predictive uh, outcome, the predicted outcome. So the interaction of X1, X2, uh, they're not additive. So this is important to keep in mind when you, when you try to um, use it for prediction of specific examples, like I did, for example, for exam one. So you cannot uh, see each of them independent when you include an interaction term. You always need to see them in the light of uh, X1, X2. And in addition, the, um, the X2 essentially, and to what extent the effect of X1 uh, on Y in the, in, in the prediction of Y is affected by X2 being present in the equation. So the presence of this interaction based on the model is for the so-called statistic interaction and may not necessarily reflect the true biological uh, interaction, which in the end will require a better understanding of the underlying biological mechanism of disease causations and the underlying risk factors. So that means that uh, this isn't statistically kind of insight, it, it must not always reflect a true biological interaction. So what does that mean when you, when, when, when you, when you recap this? You remember when, I, when we looked at um, the blood pressure dynamic, right? This essentially is, uh, you gotta keep in mind that what you're seeing here, it's caused by a biological dynamic. So here in this example, for example, I mentioned the menopause, right? And this is hypothetically one of the reasons that we could, uh, we could look at. So you have these hormonal protective factors on the cardiovascular system that women do have, that men do not have. That's why men also have earlier cardiovascular diseases as women. But this protective factor disappears after menopause. And whether this at all is now uh, reflected in this model, 
is hard to say, but it could be one of the reasons that points or that, that uh, results then in these differences in the associations. So what this implies is that it is related to a biological dynamic, but it's not necessarily truly reflecting this biological dynamic because hypothetically, when you think about it, likely it will not increase like that steadily. It will not be a linear increase. And this is where you also, you're at this point in time in your education, you're, you're bound to linear models, but essentially what you would see is likely something that will only like slowly increase but then after menopause hits, and this is like somewhere in the age between 55 and 65, I guess is pretty much the, 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 the population averages, or the, the range within the populations. And then after that, you essentially will see a much steeper increase than you actually see here with the blue line. So this means that it's statistically determined, but it is not necessarily uh, a true biologic interaction, which essentially you can only conclude when you really then specifically look at mechanisms or uh, causative factors or causative dynamics that you understand from the population and uh, the underlying risk factor dynamic. Then we have RCTs. Good, RCTs, you know that you have uh, two groups. You have a control group. So in the simplest setting, you have a control group and you have an intervention group. These two uh, groups you follow over time and you basically, you may see that uh, some of the parameters that you have looked at, baseline parameters, and this is also to be kept in mind. It's not something that was captured during the control trial. You will need in the simplest setting again, in the simplest setting, your interaction will determine the baseline variables. So essentially, if you have baseline variables that do interact to some extent, you can uh, test for interactions on your longitudinal data from the RCD or your changes over time in both groups, which you're comparing. But these changes from a, a randomization time to an endpoint in the study, they may be affected by baseline variables or by interactions in baseline variables where gender and education, for example, could already play a role in your determination of the treatment effect of your new blood pressure drug. So you will need to test for these interactions and you test them using continuous variables so you basically, you are uh, including a continuous interaction term in that model that you're running. So whether this is a, a randomization versus study and kind of model, or uh, you can also run longitudinal models if you have several factors, you will hear about this in BIOS too. So you essentially, you can uh, see uh, an inclusion of the treatment effect and this continuous variable. So if you say, for example, okay, systolic blood pressure, I think that my systolic blood pressure is dependent on the level of, uh, of, of, of education at baseline. And if you want to take this uh, into account, you will test for this interaction in your assessment of the treatment effect. And you will then have the possibility to test for uh, this interaction in subgroup analysis, where you essentially you stratify as per your subgroups of education, and you're testing your treatment effect in these subgroups of, uh, of education. So, and sometimes in these quote unquote secondary subgroup analysis, you will see treatment effects that you may not have seen in the overall population. And this is uh, hypothesis generating to some extent at this point. And that's the problem again, when you do this analysis, and this is what I mentioned before with the remarks, and this is something which that particular paper uh, that I have worked on, 
you then um, have as a problem, as a limitation, it's like you're restricting yourself with your sample size. So you have to sign an RCT with a certain sample size based on that power that you wanted to achieve. Uh, based on the power calculation, you have studied a certain number of, of, of uh, participants. And if you have then to resort to subgroup analysis, your subgroup analysis are not as um, powered as your overall analysis. So you gotta keep that in mind, right? This is what reviewers are gonna respond to you if you bring uh, into discussion subgroup analysis uh, in reporting of your RCTs. So, uh, but it will corroborate the benefit of a treatment. It will allow for you to generate new hypothesis or gain new insight. But again, you have uh, hypothetically, you have a risk of, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of, of drawing an inadequately powered uh, insight. Um, interactions may further include uh, if you do a prediction model rather than a confounding model, it increases your predictability, so the accuracy of a prediction, but it also runs at the risk of overfitting your model. And that's, that's a problem by its own right. Yeah, Professor Sag makes the point that interaction can cause confusions, and he's certainly right, yeah. <laughs> And Simpson's paradox is a pretty good, uh, pretty good example. Um, so you find Simpson's paradox in the context of various, uh, various use cases, uh, several case examples. Um, so you essentially have here the example, I find this a brilliant example that Professor Zeng has included here. Um, so you have income as a function of education. So you would, well, there's, there's, there's a reason why we aspire to get higher levels of education. It's like, obviously it's, it's, it's hopefully not income alone, but it does play, does play into the decision whether you're gonna do a master or you're do a second master, or whether you do a PhD is like, you have in the back of your head, it's like, yeah, I wanna also be able to uh, have a good income with that and have a, have a, have a good future career. So, this dynamic essentially is then somewhat counterintuitive, right? Because you would expect that the longer you get education, the better your income is gonna get. That is not necessarily true apparently when looking at this graph, which shows a decrease in the income with years of education. So the longer you go to university, you actually get less money. And this would, uh, so this is not cumulative data, it seems to be annual data. So I don't know where he has the data from, but it seems like there's a decrease in income with years of education. So what does this mean? It means that we may be looking at something that is called Simpson's paradox. Simpson's paradox essentially means that when you look at a relationship within a whole population, um, the relationships and the whole population seem to appear different than when you look in strata of interest. And this is exactly what seems to have happened here. So after stratification, you have uh, both males and females actually have an increase in their income. So now, why do we see then in the overall population a decrease of our income? How does that make any sense? And this is what Simpson's paradox says. If you if you combine several samples, several strata that you need to see in in in, in a separate fashion, and this emphasizes the importance of interaction, right? And the importance of sometimes resort to super subgroup analysis, and you always you need to see relationships and dynamics in a more holistic view. You need to understand the biological uh, variability and the biological meaning and the biologically um, relevance of what you're looking at, right? And so when you look at this particular graph here, you know this, and this is, this is why this is, this is a really fascinating example, right? Because you would expect exactly this relationship 
for both groups. But then you would also expect the same kind of relationship here for the overall population dynamic, right? Why do you not see it? Because it becomes an, it's somewhat, it's, it's like a statistically arithmetic artifact. It's not an artifact. Well, I'm not sure it's an artifact. Well, it is an artifact, I think, to some extent. No, but again, I'm, I'm maybe I'm not qualified to use your terminology. Oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe this is not something we should uh, get too um, confident in. Um, okay, so we are seeing here an increase with males, right? And the males are indicated with these crosses, whereas the females are here, uh, the circles. So both increase. But when you, when you know this here, it seems like males do end their education here somewhat after 11 years. Only females essentially have more education and basically have here outliers of up to like almost 16 years of education. Um, the dynamic seems to be comparable, but what happens is that females start off lower they start off substantially lower and overall the proportion of females here in the higher ranges is substantially larger than of males. So that means that overall there's a preponderance of women getting uh, more education. They have to start with, right from the start, lower levels of education, uh, lower levels of incomes. And essentially this makes that relationship when you look at it in the entire population tilt downwards. And that's a fascinating uh, example. And it is to some extent likely also, and I'm hanging myself again out of the window using a term which I'm not sure is right in this context, but I think it is. I think it's kind of a regression to the mean phenomenon, uh, but essentially it basically tilts it towards the extremes and it will basically tip the slope towards there where you have an extreme weight, an extreme strong weight and extreme arithmetic values, which are essentially here greater than those for the man. So this makes this relationship basically show an inverse kind of association. So it's just an interesting example. So please uh, have a look at um, this and then think it through. Um, we can. We can have a longer conversation about it. I can, uh, if, if there's some interest, please comment on the discussion board. We can, we can have a further conversation about that. Okay, so now lastly, let's look into lab nine. So lab nine is a subgroup analysis conducted with the help RCT. So using the help RCT data, you are being asked to fit models with the following variables. So you have a response Y with a link status one, linked and zero otherwise. So we know this data set already. Then we have the covariate X1, which is treat, treated with either one or zero. And then we have uh, substances used with alcohol, cocaine or heroin. And we have model one will be conducted without interaction, model two with an interaction between X1, X2. Um, populate the following table and upload the R code and results. Good. Uh, I hope this is clear. We're gonna do the lab uh, in the in a separate video. We're gonna talk through what Marcel and Bino have discussed in the spring uh, semester, and um, then uh, you can you can work on this lab independently. All right. So thank you for your attention and thank you for watching this video. And uh, I will uh, upload this as well as the lab video them independently. All right.